Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the first high weekly research seminar of the spring quarter. I am Daniel John. I'm the policy research manager at Stanford High and the manager of AI Index. It's my great pleasure to introduce Jack Clark here. Jack is the co-chair of the AI Index Steering Committee, the co-founder of Anthropic, an AI safety and research company working to build reliable, interpretable, and steerable AI systems. Jack is also the co-chair of OEC's working group on AI and compute and a non-resident research fellow at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown University. Many of you probably also know him from his work on AI in Core Newsletter, which is about AI and AI policy, read by more than 25,000 people around the world. And he was formerly the policy director of Open AI. In today's seminar, Jack will present the key findings of the 2022 AI Index report just released on March 16th. The AI Index is an annual study of impact and progress here, and I will let um, Jack talk a little bit more about that. But the 2022 version um, measures and evaluates the rapid rate of AI advancement from multiple ends, such as research development, technical performance, technical ethics, AM policy and governance, economy and education, and more. The goal of the report is really to ground this conversation about AI progress and impact um, on data, enabling decision makers like policymakers, like researchers, or like industry, private sector employees to take meaningful actions to advance AI responsibly and ethically. Before we start the conversation, um, just a few logistics. You can use the Zoom chat to message the group but um, please submit your questions via Slido. You can use the QR code here on the screen to ask questions through Slido, or you can click on the link that will be shared in the chat shortly. I will be moderating the questions throughout and choosing question from Slido. It has a nice upvote feature so that I can choose questions all of you are most interested in. Finally, the closed caption has also been enabled for this webinar. Simply click on the CC feature on your Zoom screen to show captions throughout the hour. Jack, thank you for joining us today. Um, and now I'm happy to hand over to you and start our presentation. Thanks very much, Daniel. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all. So I'm going to share my slides and start the presentation. And uh, per Daniel's introduction. If anyone wants to give me another role where I can call myself a co-chair or co-something of other, I'd, I'd love to, as it seems like I'm really, really racking those up at the moment. So welcome to the AI Index talk. For this talk, I'm mostly going to focus on uh, highlights of what's been happening in the index overall, and then diving into specific chapters. And I am going to conclude with a highly subjective personal interpretation of the data. So my own views, not the views of the broader steering committee. Um, as a reminder, the AI index is now in its fifth year. That's a long time in AI. AI seems to run according to the dog year principle, well, where about one year of progress in AI is equivalent to seven years of progress in other forms of technology and science. And it's worth remembering that, you know, back in 2017, we were marveling at DeepMind's result about AlphaGo and, and basic reinforcement learning algorithms that were beginning to work. Now in 2022, we're looking at general purpose language models that can sort of take in arbitrary text and output arbitrary things in response, reinforcement learning agents that operate in the 3D world, robots that actually work. Uh, a lot has happened and we should keep that in mind. For this talk, I, uh, I lean heavily on the AI Index Larger Steering Committee, which I, which I put up here. So it includes my, my co-chair, Ray Perot, you know, Eric Brindioffson, John Etchemendi, Tara Lyons, Juan Carlos, Michael Salito, James Vanika, Yov Shoham, Daniel Zhang, who's moderating this, Nestor, who joined us this year and did fantastic work on the report, and two of our contractors who we had this year, Helen No and uh, Eli Sakahi, who both did really meaningful work on the ethics chapter, which we'll be diving into. We also collaborate broadly across the, across the AI sort of industry. And so again, everything I'm saying relies on our, our partners and, and collaborators. So thank you to them for, for helping us make this report. But first, I thought before diving into the index, it's worth just focusing on what happens in AI while we're asleep. And what I literally mean here is I woke up this morning <laughs> 
and I looked at archive and I looked at some of the papers on archive and I thought I'd just extract a few just to give us a sense of where we are circa today in March 2022. You know, we have interesting papers on uh, multimodal fusion of image and non-image data in disease diagnosis and prognosis. So AI systems that pair multiple modalities together to get smarter. We have a large scale knowledge repository for understanding hand object interaction. In other words, a big data set to help us train better classifiers and, and potentially robots. We have exploring sort of a further type of adversarial attack for face forgery detection. So ways to attack AI systems that are being deployed in the world. We have an interesting paper from DeepMind that showed that they could train a language model that was more than half the size of their previous largest model, but had better performance than it. And that's going to relate to something I'll talk about later in the talk about industrialization. We also had a paper showing how you could use language models to improve the reasoning of other language models. So AI stacking on AI. Uh, we have an interesting paper showing how you can basically improve click-through rate prediction in an e-commerce application, just to remind us that AI is being deployed. And finally, this mammoth paper came out from a bunch of Chinese researchers um, called A Roadmap for Big Model. And what that really is, is uh, them talking about the sort of foundation models, big language models type stuff that we'll cover in, in this talk and giving a statement of intent that they want to develop much larger and more significant ones. So the reason I gave you those highlights was just to really remind us all that AI is now happening at such a like increased rate of uh, development and deployment that just staying on top of it's really challenging. And that's what we try and do in the index, but we should all bear in mind that every year it's getting harder because AI is becoming more integrated into the economy and the world around us. So let's get into the highlights. First, there's more money than ever. Um, we have saw money, almost double on, from the previous year in terms of private investment into AI. And just to give us a sense of where we've come from and where we're going to, 2013, you're talking about a billion, two billion being invested annually in AI companies, AI startups. Now, 2021, uh, almost sort of eight, eight, nine years later, we've got 94 billion being invested. So the level of capital financing has massively increased. At the same time, we're seeing a smaller number of companies get funded. And that relates to some of the technical trends I'll be covering later. But it's worth remembering that at the same time we have capital rising, we also have concentration in the AI sort of ecosystem supporting these, these companies. Though there's obviously a huge amount of geopolitical competition between the US and China, the US and China are the main like leaders in cross-country collaboration on AI. They have tightly internet scientific communities. And I personally find it quite reassuring that even in times of tension, we still have this big scientific global community chugging along together. We also have a sense of how other nations are collaborating. And here we see a couple of things. One. The, the United Kingdom is kind of showing up really, really well here. That makes sense. It has good universities. Uh, it has companies like DeepMind. And it also has deep links with both China and US. And I think of it almost as a third, third point on the sort of collaboration, collaboration map. And then after that, you basically see the US and China trading places in cross-country collaboration. So that just affirms to us how significant the US and China play uh, a role in terms of AI development. Now, in recent years, we've started developing language models that actually work. Uh, the problem with an AI technology that actually works is once it actually works, you can get it to do actually bad stuff as well as good stuff. And so here we see a graph showing the probability of a language model saying something biased in response to a biased prompt. So I say to you, um, Men like Jack Clark are so dumb because it'll have a high chance of contributing of continuing that in a, in a biased way or stereotypical way. And this should just remind us that these are inherently dual use technologies. We can prompt it with something nice and get something nice in response. We can prompt it with something biased and we'll get something biased in response. 
in some sense, these are luxurious problems to have. Years ago, the thought of being able to get a language model that could generate anything longer than a sentence that was coherent was a pipe dream. Now we have this luxurious problem of AI systems that can generate pages and pages of text, but the text can have different qualities or different attributes, some of which are inappropriate. As a consequence of this type of thing, we're seeing a massive rise in AI ethics. And what I mean by that is the number of people studying AI ethics, submitting papers about AI ethics is, is increasing. And we also see a rising share of industry contributions here. Industry is starting to show up in AI ethics, partly because industry is deploying these technologies which have ethical issues and ethical challenges. It's also getting more efficient for us to train AI systems. What I mean by efficiency is the time it is taking us to train an AI system to do a fairly generic task, ranging from object detection to image classification to recommendation systems is decreasing. That's decreasing as a consequence of algorithmic improvements, better underlying compute, more efficient use of data. All of these things are combining to create more efficient, repeatable technology, which partly explains why it's becoming more widely deployed in the world. Along with it getting more efficient, it's also getting a lot cheaper. So 2017, you know, back when we did the first AI index report, it had cost you about $1,100 to train a decent computer vision system on a public cloud. Fast forward to 2021, and it costs you $4.60. So let's call that $5 just, on, just to be conservative. It's an incredible reduction in the price it costs to train something. And again, that should remind us why AI is being deployed right now is that it's become more efficient. It's become a lot cheaper to deploy as well. And whenever something gets cheaper, there's a lot more of it. That's what our economy around us incentivizes and AI is no different. Additionally, if we look at the frontier, as in not just what I showed you of training a basic computer vision capability, but the frontier of something like ImageNet, a well-known competition where people are battling to see how well they can train a system with the best classification accuracy against this large data set. You'll see in recent years the rise of the use of extra training data. And what that means is it's not just about training on ImageNet now and having a smart algorithm and good computers, to get to the frontier. It's now about trading on ImageNet, having a smart algorithm, good, co good computers, and a giant data set. And so that also explains why we're seeing industry show up more and more on these benchmarks, because companies like you know, Google or Facebook or Microsoft have huge private image repositories and broader data repositories that they could use to just further amp up the performance of these algorithms. As a consequence, uh, there's more global legislation on AI than ever. Those of you sort of tuning into this seminar, I'm sure are familiar with the European Commission's work here. Additionally, we have seen, and I'm going to come to this later, a rise in general interest in other geographies as well. But all of this tells us that along with being integrated into the economy, AI is soon to be regulated within the economy, which is something that the industry just hasn't seen. Uh, at all in its recent years and will be a bumpy but interesting ride for all of us. So those are some of the top highlights. And before I go into the individual chapter summaries, I just sort of wanted to repeat back to you what, what I think of the significant things here. You know, it's getting faster to develop stuff. It's getting cheaper to develop stuff. And if you want to play at the frontier, you need to expend more resources than ever to make certain research breakthroughs, like the usage of data. So that's a meaningful thing. And we pair this with the analysis of capital, and we see that there's more capital, but the capital's going to a smaller number of entities. Again, that might be explained by the usage of these sorts of techniques and also the fact that AI has gone from something quite speculative to something more well understood. So capital then stacks its chips on a smaller number of entities. And yet, while all of this is going on, we know that the ethical issues of AI are becoming more pronounced because we no longer have like the ethical issues of something that can play space invaders and maybe is biased. 
we have the ethical issues of a computer vision system that scans people's faces and is biased, or a language model that can do almost anything and can display biases. So the types of problems that we're dealing with have gone from sort of important but academically interesting to important and some problems would affect everyone who uses this stuff. So that's that's worth sort of bearing at the, the top of our minds. Now I'm going to go into some of the chapter highlights. So research and development, there's a kind of tale of two, two halves here. On the one hand, if we look at raw publications in uh, AI, we see China has gone from sort of a peer with uh, the EU and US to <coughs> leading the number of publications being published. But quality doesn't always relate to quantity. And if we do a further analysis of the citation patterns here, you'll actually see that the, the US kind of continues to lead in citations. And China has been on like a, a roughly increasing trend line here but it hasn't been quite matched by the extreme trend increase it has in publication sort of quantity. So wanted to explain this to you to sort of show that there's multiple ways you can look at data, multiple ways you can cut it, and you, you need multiple views to have a sense of, of where nations rank. Secondly, if we look at how sort of collaborations work, what we're seeing is a sustained rise in sort of the number of uh, collaborations between academia, which is education here, and nonprofit or government actors, but also this steep rise of company and academia sort of collaboration together. And I think that the company and academia stuff is, is one of the more significant trends, because though it may be relatively small in, in terms of number of AI publications, it's relatively large in terms of its effect on the industry. We're also seeing the rise of AI patent filing. Um, you know, it's increased by more than 30 times since 2011 or so. And that's significant because AI patents are one of the things that speak to the economic relevance of the technology and the realization by companies that they want to sort of nail down IP associated with AI so that they mostly so they could be protected from legal cases in the future, also that they can make patents and never use them as some, some actors in the industry do to try and keep the industry open. But it's all a symptom of the greater impact AI is having and the greater amount of deployment that is occurring here. Now let's go on to technical performance. So uh, though we're talking about really impressive stuff here, it's worth pointing out that these systems continue to be really dumb and make really dumb mistakes. Uh, so. Let's take the abductive natural language inference, ANLI benchmark, and you'll see that despite the arrival of really powerful new systems like GPT-3 or Gopher or Lambda, we're still not quite at the human baseline on, on quite, a, quite a challenging natural language inference problem. At the same time, on simpler tasks, we have blown past human baselines. Uh, so this is squad which is a, an NLP sort of assessment system from Stanford. The meaningful thing to note here is that not all benchmarks are the same. Some benchmarks are kind of easy, like the squad benchmark evidently was, whereas some like a ANLI are weirdly hard. And one of the things that we try and do the index is just pull in as many benchmarks as possible to get a sense of where the hard parts are and where the easy parts are in technical performance. Reinforcement learning, which is a sort of subfield of, of, of AI, has recently gone to a interesting place. You know, a few years ago, RL was mostly being used for things like Go and here, stuff like chess, where you're seeing that it in a specific task can do incredibly well. More interestingly, we're starting to see evidence that reinforcement learning systems are beginning to be capable of generalization. So this graph shows performance on a benchmark called ProcGen. What's ProcGen? Well, ProcGen is a benchmark that challenges an AI system to solve environments which themselves are procedural. And what I show you on the bottom right are just some images of all the different types of environments it's playing. And not only are these environments procedural, but they're also games with different rules and rule sets. 
So what this is showing us is RL is starting to transition from being good at single tasks that it's highly engineered for to like suites of tasks. And in that sense, RL is starting to look a bit like computer vision and natural language, which have both started to generalize much more broadly than they had in the past. So maybe this tells us that reinforcement learning is about to become a big deal in terms of AI deployment, as well as just AI research. Also, we did a survey for the AI index this year to try and understand the types of robotic arms that you know, faculty at a variety of universities had and robotic systems. And what we see is the prices of sort of robot arms are starting to get a bit cheaper over time. We need to get more data here. We need to do it for a few more years. But I think it holds that we're seeing a transition in, in academia from using very expensive industrial arms from, you know, companies like KUKA, Universal Robots, FANUC, to much cheaper arms sort of built for a new a new era of like AI research where we basically got algorithms that are robust enough but you don't need an arm with the highest amount of precision possible you need an arm that's kind of cheap and repeatable and so we're starting to see this show up in terms of what exists in academia and as I mentioned earlier when you make something cheaper there tends to be more of it so if robot arm prices are getting are, are going down a bit then we're probably going to get more research based around robotic arms and other robotic systems. I'm now going to give some discussion of the technical AI ethics section. And again, I wanted to give a huge shout out to Helen and Ellie, who are these two contractors we worked with this year. This chapter would not have been possible without them and they did a huge amount of work on it. <laughs> so we've discussed this, this issue of language model capability and also bias. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but it's just worth affirming that we now have really, really powerful systems, but these systems have really, really significant challenges. And ethical challenges are not the same as technical challenges. Ethical challenges require a socio-technical approach to solving them and are going to be a lot harder to solve than traditional technical benchmarks. So it's worth knowing that that's, that's a problem we're all going to, all going to face. We've also seen this sustained rise in, rise in AI ethics with industry starting to play more of a role. There have been these worries in the past about industry capture of fields, and I don't think that AI ethics will be you know, any different to that. So we should be aware that once industry starts to enter, there's a chance that it starts to take over. The graphs don't show that yet, but the graphs tell us that at some point this might happen. We also have a new class of models called um, sort of multimodal models. I referred to one earlier when I gave the archive summary. A good example of a multimodal model is something like CLIP, an AI system released by OpenAI. And CLIP combines joint representation of images and words. So CLIP models tend to be a lot more robust than prior you know, models that we used for things like image classification. But if you look at the sorts of biases they show up in terms of like image labels and such, they also learn quite complicated biases. And these biases are going to be harder for us to deal with because they're multimodal. So we have this very interesting problem in AI now where we've got a massive expansion in capabilities of the systems we have. But that means the problems we have to work on have expanded as well. And this is just a reminder that, you know, you thought bias was challenging when we were just doing image recognition or just doing text generation. Well, it's going to get a lot more challenging when we do multimodal. So worth knowing this problem is, if anything, sort of increasing in, in, in import and impact. Couple more chapters, and then I'll go to my highly subjective conclusion. And then we're going to be doing uh lots of time for questions because i see there's a ton coming in on the chat and thank you for engaging on this i i, I hope that it's going to be a really robust and interesting discussion so the economy and education what you sort of see here is data which basically shows the relative number of jobs in different countries in that relate to ai and so it makes sense intuitively that large countries like the US or China aren't at the top here because they have very diverse, very large economies. Um, but what we do see 
it's specialization emerging. You know, New Zealand, Hong Kong, and Ireland are all leading in terms of this sort of hiring index data that we got from LinkedIn. And it suggests that though these countries may not be able to sort of like dominate research in the way that US or China do, they have an opportunity to specialize their economies so that they become like hotbeds of AI talent. And so we're going to keep tracking this kind of metric because I think it'll speak to the competitiveness of, of sort of middle or smaller nations in, in a while with regard to AI. When we look at the, at the US specifically, we find some uh, deeply unsurprising things, but I think sometimes this is just reassuring because it tells us our data is good. Uh, Unsurprisingly, the number of AI postings in the sort of in California, Texas, New York, and Virginia are among the highest in the US. That makes sense. Silicon Valley's in California. New York has uh, a burgeoning AI scene of its own, great universities and fintech. Texas is where a load of people seem to have moved during the pandemic and where companies have opened up really big research centers. And then Virginia you know, sits cheek by jowl with the US government, which does a lot of AI stuff, some of which is public, some of which is not. Further to what I gave him the highlights, it's just really worth emphasizing that the amount of money that's flowing into AI now is substantial. Um, it's hard for me to give comparatives relative to other industries like biotech, and I'm realizing now that for next year's report, we'll try and do that. But you can do a lot with $94 billion. And so this is now like flowing into the AI sector and is going to lead to further deployment and development of the technology. We also see this concentration pattern I talked about earlier. So I'll skip through that in the interest of time. When we break down where the investments are going, we see that sort of data management, processing, and, 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 and sort of cloud computing are seeing some of the highest levels of investment followed by, and let me just move my Zoom thing so I can give you the most accurate reading. Yeah, followed by medical and healthcare, uh, FinTech and automated vehicles, plus semiconductors. And I want to give a, a quick call out to semiconductors, which is that today, most AI researchers train deep learning models on graphical processing units, typically from NVIDIA, sometimes from AMD, depending on how comfortable they are dealing with the software there. One thing that's starting to change is we're building custom training chips and custom inference chips like Google's tensor processing unit. And there's a whole bunch of startups working in this area. So it's worth knowing that some of the investment money is going to infrastructure, which will directly improve the efficiency and the cost of training AI systems. So it's going to sharpen those trends I talked about earlier and lead to really significant knock-on effects. The US uh, leads the world in terms of the number of newly funded AI companies by, by geography. And as we see from this graph, both China and, and EU have been just sort of steadily, steadily climbing. At the same time, we've also seen diffusion. So what's not shown on this graph is a, a, a more substan substantial rise in other smaller countries, though they have absolute much smaller numbers. It's also showing us that there's a more uh, global distribution occurring in the, in the AI space. And as you can see here, we have, you know, some of the sort of usual suspects are showing up who weren't on that graph, you know, Israel, France, Canada, Japan, India, Germany, and so on and so forth. Perhaps most strikingly, uh, one in every five computer science PhD graduates now specializes in AI slash machine learning. Uh, that's significant and, and actually pretty wild to me. Um, it tells us that the interest in this at the, at the graduate student and undergraduate level is just, is just huge. And it also tells us that the amount of talent that's going to be produced in these areas is really significant as well. A question it makes me ask myself is what that means for interdisciplinary education in the future. Are we going to have these PhDs go and pick up other disciplines as well, or are they just going to stay as AI slash ML people? And that will have some, some significant effects, especially on areas like ethics. Relatedly, we continue to see this problem of industry brain drain. Uh, it's sustained. It's been going on for a decade. 
and it probably explains to us why industry is playing such an outsized role in AI development and deployment. And while I don't have any specific problem with industry, I am always deeply suspicious of massive concentrations of things anywhere. And so I'm suspicious that the vast concentration of AI PhDs now is in industry, and I wonder what that means for, for how, the, how the sector will develop. Finally, I'm going to talk about AI policy and governance, then give a brief concluding uh, set of remarks, and then we'll go to, the, go to the questions, which I'm very excited about. So the number of AI-related bills that passed into law in 25 countries from 2016 to 21 has grown to 18 now. These range from small bills to large bills. You know, there are things like the Deep Fake Detection Act, which passed in the US, to massive batches of legislation like that proposed by the European Commission, which is starting to be baked into law. So we're starting to see legislative interest and awareness pick up. The number of bills passed into law in select countries remains relatively small though, you know, three in the US, three in the UK, three in Spain. Uh, it's just not, it's not that significant yet. And it's more an indication of interest and awareness than a vast change that's about to take place. And uh, perhaps dispiritingly, uh, but it's also worth just calling this out, US legislators are proposing tons and tons of AI bills. Uh, the number passing is <laughs> minimal to be, to be generous. That probably speaks to the larger political dynamics at play in the US. It also tells us something about where politicians' heads are at, which is they think that this is important and they want to signal to their constituents that AI is important, though perhaps there isn't the bipartisan will there or agreement to actually pass some of these things into law. So worth knowing there's, there's a mismatch there. Things are a bit better on the state level. States are actually passing AI-related bills at a higher rate than the, than the sort of federal, federal policy-making infrastructure. That probably relates to the fact that states can be inherently a bit more partisan and where where it's a bit more partisan you can get a bit more agreement so that may explain this and finally this year's congress is on track to have the highest number of mentions of ai in a congressional uh, record by legislative session that is significant because mentions kind of chain out to a whole load of language and bills and, and, and language in, in things like research reports and basically condition the environment that staffers and politicians, for lack of a better word, swim in in DC. So the higher the number of mentioned, the higher the chance of subsequent actual legislative action, as well as awareness about these issues. So my concluding remarks before we go to questions are me trying to work out what does any of this mean? And I think the, the story which comes through from this data is AI has obviously transitioned from being an area of academic interest to one of academic prestige. But per the slide I showed you about the number of computer science PhDs, it's now an academic priority area. You know, it's the top, it's the top contributor for CS PhDs in the United States. We know that there are international dynamics which look similar. In related news, you know, the technology has gone from technology innovation, as in something occurring in research and the, the academic sector, to something that's become more repeatable. You know, it's got cheaper to do basic image recognition. It's got more efficient to do. So we're now on the stage of technology deployment. Because once something is cheap and repeatable, you make a lot of it. <laughs> you, you, you incorporate it into the economy. We've gone from capital infusion 10 years ago, as in some venture capital firms, you know, putting money into some of the early startups oriented around using sort of deep learning and mach modern machine learning techniques to an increase in the amount of capital scale. You know, remember that capital for AI startups doubled in the last year to now the signs of sort of capital concentration, which is basically what happens when you're starting to try to pick winners in something you think will be a big industry. We've gone from AI being mainly something done by academic research to something being done by academic and industry research in partnership to something where a much higher proportion of AI research at the frontier 
is being dominated by industry. Like in the case of large language models, it's just industry actors that have developed them. In the case of the frontier of ImageNet, it's just industry actors that are pushing that frontier upward by virtue of having access to these extra larger data sets. And so it's worth sort of reflecting on that because once industry dominates research in an area, the incentives for research in that area get shifted quite dramatically to what benefits industry. And that may have an impact on things like ethics and other things that we know are important, but which industry has both incentives and counter incentives to focus on. Finally, we've gone from legislative awareness, which I characterize as legislators starting to talk about it, which we saw in the congressional record, to what I'll call legislative signaling. Legislators are trying to show people they are aware of AI and are proposing bills relating to AI, but we're not quite at the stage of legislative action yet. Uh, and when we get there, things are going to become really dramatic, but it's not, it's not here yet. So in other words, uh, it's an industrial revolution and things might be fine, but it's ultimately up to us. So I'm excited to, to do some discussion now and thank you all for attending my talk. Appreciate it. Uh, Dan, let me know what to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut my slides off and then we'll go from there. Yeah, thanks, Jack. And we got a lot of questions coming in. And thank you, everyone, for engaging with us on this. So just you started off, you've been doing this for five years. This is the fifth edition of the AI Index. In your experience of tracking the AI progress, what has been the easiest to measure and what has been the hardest to measure in general? Yeah, so the easiest stuff has actually always been image, uh, image recognition, image classification, object identification, basically because when we started the index in 2017, these technologies were already quite mature, you know, they've matured over the last five, five years or so, and were already being deployed. And so there was just like, well known understanding of how to measure these things. And it's a sufficiently competitive area that everyone was doing it. So that was the easy part. What's been hard? Um, reinforcement learning has, uh, to speak candidly, Daniel knows this because he's worked with me on these chapters, has been really hard to measure. And that's because everyone doing reinforcement learning has had different specialist data sets they use. Like DeepMind really loves testing on the Atari corpus of Atari games, but not so many other people did. So it's hard to compare and contrast. Uh, the procedural generation benchmark from, from OpenAI I, I, when I worked at opening, I, I was very excited about that. And it does seem to now be getting enough pickup. We might be able to get some signal there. Uh, and finally, it's always been hard to measure performance on robots. And that's because robots, if I have a robot arm in lab A and a robot arm in lab B, and they're doing the same task, I still can't compare their performance because things like air pressure, heat, and light will be different in all of those labs and it will affect performance so significantly, it's hard to back out what's true. Yeah, and I know we've been we talked about this a lot as um, outside the technical realm. Um, how can you know maybe a lot of audience here are from different government organizations mm -hmm. and private companies? How can us contributing to this broader effort of imagining AI? What kind of more data do you want to see to um, help measure maybe policy realm, maybe economy realm, yeah. and um, yeah, how can we contribute? I really want data about AI incidents. And what I mean by that is everyone's familiar with examples like Microsoft's Tay, uh, where they had an AI system, they deployed it and some stuff went wrong. Similarly, people are, are familiar with gender shades, you know, um, mm. uh, Joy Buluimi, Tim Nick Cabru and Deb Raji test out on a load of computer vision systems, they find biases and they publish. I want more of these incidents because now when I present the AI index, I am getting asked about what does it mean in terms of deployment? And I have to say, well, we just measure the symptoms of deployment. It's hard to measure deployment itself. And yeah. that's because companies don't seem to have an incentive to share these incidents, even though that would be a very useful kind of knowledge base to give us. Yeah, and so kind of related to that, uh, we've been a lot of questions about industry involvement of addressing ethical concerns. And I'm just gonna combine a few questions from different audience um, here is saying like the, the solving the problem of algorithm bias is challenging. Um, what uh, have you seen in industry? How have they been addressing ethical concerns related to issues like transparency, data sharing, and 
do you believe they will share information and best practices to improve the performance of those models? I think that we have started to see it being normalized. If you test out language models are for bias. Uh, you know, we did find an open AI in the GPT-2 paper, and then it started to, I, I don't think we were first, but we, you know, we made a decision to do mm -hmm. that because we thought it was the right thing. And we've seen a lot of other companies start to do that more. So I think that just testing your systems against them and publishing the results is the thing that we need more people in industry to do. There are obvious reasons why people in industry don't want to do this, but I ultimately think that uh, everyone knows enough about AI and the AI index will keep publishing. So, so it's going to be really hard to hide this. And I think that we, we need to kind of collectively bite the bullet and work on that. The other thing which I think is effective is building evaluation suites to test out the biases of an AI system and then releasing those evaluation suites. Because one of the ways yeah. to orient yourself in this domain is to test. And finding biased tests is actually kind of challenging today, and we don't have many. So I'm hoping industry will show up there. Yep. Um, and throughout the report, when we're, uh, when we're um, kind of writing it, we noticed that in a lot of the metrics we do on R&D, on investment, or um, industry ad adoption, the natural language processing field is advancing very fast. So this question from Mark, what are the implications of NLP advancing faster than other subdomains of AI? Well, some of it is fashion uh, in the, you know, image recognition advanced at a crazy speed from like 2013 to 2016, uh, partly because we had something like a convolutional neural net, which people were able to think about. And then you had technological improvements like residual networks and highway networks and other things. Mm -hmm. um, and also economic relevance. I think now we've just got, for a variety of reasons, NLP is easy to work on. It has the, sh the same shared underlying system, which is a transformer architecture model. So everyone's kind of like computer vision working on the same model base and then iterating improvements from there. Uh, two, it has seeming economic relevance. People are interested in incorporating this into search engines, you know, incorporating this into services. And three, it it gives us systems that seem to actually be quite general in a way that we haven't had before. And I think most researchers working in AI work on it because they want to build generally capable things. And so since NLP seems to display this quality, we're seeing a lot of application there. Uh, in four years, I expect there will be a different fashion. So it's worth noting that this is like cool now, but it will change. Uh, we have a question on the research development chapter, which we highlighted as um, um, the collaborations between US-China researchers. So um, this question is collaboration between the US and China researchers continue to rise. What does this say about effect of geopolitics on research? Yeah. Are concerns about this so-called arms race or China overtaking US over hype? I, I think you need to split research from deployment. Mm -hmm. So research, I think it's so important that we maintain a shared research community. I also, um, I'm one of those nerds that reads a lot about the history of nuclear weapons and the Cold War, because I guess I like cheerful hobbies. Yeah. But what you saw there is that even during the Cold War, Soviet and United States nuclear researchers would gather together. They'd gather together at places like the Pugwash Conference, and they would back channel to each other. So let's be real, there will be a rise, a sustained rise in tensions between the US and China. It's just locked in and it's nothing to do with AI, it's just AI is part of it. But as long as we maintain that research community, we maintain a kind of safety buffer. That's gonna be really, really important, especially if like researchers in the US or in China discover some safety problem with a general, a more general AI system. You want, you want that information to propagate or everyone loses. Um, I do think that there will be sustained competition on deployment. You know, China already deploys computer vision systems attached to CCTV systems at a scale that no other country does. So there are things here where there will be areas of competition, but I'm hoping that we can keep the competition in the sort of commercial realm and have some shared research infrastructure. Yeah, I definitely share with you. I'm a student of international affairs. It's really interesting to see that in that realm, there's all this talk about arms race and how countries compete each other. But when we really come to research, there's still a lot of 
collaborations between few countries. You can see you see a lot of Chinese private companies have their research labs here in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. on Palo Alto, and we have a lot of um, you know U.S. companies that like Microsoft that also has research labs and centers in China. Uh, next question um, is something that I'm particular. I'm very interested in myself, and we, I think we'll do more on this for the index um, in the next few years. Is the public communication and public perception about AI? So the question is, how do you think public communication about AI, especially about risk from AI, will or should change in the next year? So when I talked about AI incidents earlier, a few people in the chat have mentioned um, Partnership on AI's AI Incident Database. There's also a couple of other ones, which I'll, I'll try and tweet a summary of this after this talk. I think being legible about AI incidents is going to be really important. And I sort of expect that I would like the AI index to do a bit more public communication on what sorts of AI incidents we're seeing and how we're seeing them unfold, because otherwise it could look like we're just trying to tell a really optimistic story. Uh, as you know, that's not it's not true. It's more that we we like lack the data to give the full the full sense of what's going on. I, I do think that public communication about AI is kind of underinvested in. Um, I write my personal newsletter, not, not for an uncalibrated person in the public, but for perhaps researchers or policy people. And I found that it seems really useful to lots of people. So I guess one bit of advice I give to everyone on this call is if you work in the industry, uh, start writing about it, like publicly and for people. Uh, that, will be, that will be helpful. It might piss off your manager, uh, but I've always managed to get by despite doing that. And, and on the other side of that, the public, you know, perception about it, the public opinion about AI, and you've worked a lot in this field, you do yeah. uh, that very important, important newsletter. Have you seen the narrative changed um, and how do you, how, how do you think it will uh, advance in the next few years? Yeah, I mean, a few years ago, uh, it was more optimistic, but I think that's because it was mostly in research. And I, I used to be a journalist before I worked in AI. And I remember being just really excited about AlphaGo or about DeepMind having a system that could play Breakout or Space Invaders, because it was cool. Like yeah. we, didn't, we didn't have to worry about like bias or weaponization or like the change of geopolitics as a consequence of surveillance. We just had like cool things doing interesting stuff. Perception has changed, and I think perception has changed partly because people are aware that these systems have really powerful capabilities that can change important aspects of society, and they want more accountability. And also because of this industry dominance. Like, look, industry isn't bad per se, but industry isn't the thing that you trust for most, right? I, I, I trust a whole bunch of people above uh, private sector actors, and you know, I work at a private sector actor, but they're hard to trust. They are plugged into a market economy system which biases them away from like maximal human flourishing and biases towards them local optimization around finance. So I think people are mostly reacting to that. And the, the reason why I personally, in my not, you know, this isn't an AI index opinion, my opinion, I work a lot on things like the National Research Cloud and trying to propose the creation of big compute infrastructure in the US and other countries. Is because we need to dilute some of industry's influence and have some AI development occur in more of uh, the commons, because otherwise I think people naturally distrust it. Yeah. Um, let's go back to the uh, large language model for a second. Uh, I think this is a very interesting question from Pete. If large language models are seen as more capable, but also more biased, do you think this implies that our definition of capable for general purpose systems might not be sufficient? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating question. Um, give me a second. <laughs> like, no, no, but I, I think that, that it, we should disentangle this a bit. Like, on one axis, you have like capabilities, right? And you have all of these different capabilities, like summarization classification, generation of legal legislation, generation of poetry. On the y-axis, you have bias. Bias seems to actually only spike on some of these capabilities. Mm -hmm. And on others, it's barely present uh, in the sense that we have run you know, quantitative tests and you see like radical differences in the display of biases here. So they're not like fully, fully conjoined as terms. Um, additionally, 
I, I feel like bias is actually part of a larger set of metrics relating to the alignment of AI systems. Uh, we actually had feedback this year that we needed to do more work on alignment. Uh, we didn't do much because there isn't much work to be done yeah. yet. But ultimately, ethics really correlates to is it appropriate? And so I basically think of the future, we're going to have AI systems be evaluated on a capability score, but also kind of an alignment score. Are they aligned with the context in which they're being deployed? And alignment will bring in bias, but it will also bring in like resilience to harmful inputs. Like an AI system cannot be biased, but can still help me build an explosive. That's that's like another part of the alignment problem. Uh, yeah. So, I, so you know, great question, Peter. I actually think that we're we're at the early stages of coming up with like a framework to think about this, and we need to incorporate bias into a whole spread of concerns relating to this technology and then quantify it. Uh, here's another question from Hal. Uh, based on your measured metrics, how far or close are we, in your opinion, to a general superintelligence significantly more intelligent than most humans? Well, every time we get a benchmark where we smash through human intelligence on it, we find another benchmark where our system is really dumb, <laughs> like yeah. compared to humans. Uh, I sometimes joke with colleagues that GPT-3 is the most expensive broken calculator in the world. And but GPT-3 can do amazing things. But, uh, uh, you know, the calculator on your phone is going to do a better job of multiplying seven numbers together than GPT-3. That's just how this technology works. And so that's to illustrate that GPT-3, way more general, uh, worst, worst and yet most expensive calculator you could buy today. And that sort of highlights the paradox here. So I won't speculate as to something like AGI because it's such a hard concept. I will say that I expect in three to five years, we are gonna have like radically more general systems than the ones we have today. And the ones that we have today, like GPT-3 and others will have been integrated so, so far into the economy, but aspects of economic activity will begin to change. And that's going to be weird. We're gonna start living in the like weird era of mass deployment of AI. And, that, and then I think we'll start to get more of a signal on generality. Yeah. and. Continue our conversation on ethics. So um, there's this question on the ethics review process. So I know at Stanford, um, uh, a professor Michael Bernstein has proposed last year to do an ethics review in addition to IRB um, within the AI research community. And we have done that for some of the high grants as well. What's your opinion on you know, the general AI ethics review process? Some of the new apps have adopted of including like an ethics yeah. statement should AI ethics committee be required along with AI ethics risk, risk analysis detailing ethical choices made as part of the process or required to be documented and published publicly? And this is a question from Jody. Yeah. Um, I think that stuff like the broader impacts statements that NIST, that NIRIPS mandates are really good because basically they devolve AI ethics to individual researchers. Now, some researchers may say, that's not my job. I'm not trained for this they weren't intended to be like a test on how well, how like ethical are you? They're mostly intended to get researchers to think ethics is my problem too. And I should think about the impacts of my work. So that seems robustly good. I think just asking people to think about the second order impacts of their stuff is useful. You know that most of it's going to be wrong, but just the act of thinking about this is going to get you used to it and let you do useful stuff in the end. I'm a bit more skeptical of ethics review committees. And that's basically because, like I was on a panel for the National Institute of Standards and Technology yesterday, NIST, being asked about how to evaluate bias in AI. And I was like, well, there isn't a standard eval procedure. There's like a load of tests. We're still building better tests. The tests are constantly changing as the technology changes. And it's gonna be really hard to come up with a standard eval today because we aren't there. And I think the ethics review bodies face a similar challenge where we don't know the correct ways to evaluate these systems yet. So more, I think we need to invest in ethics benchmarks and more uh, increase the number of people creating these sorts of things and testing, because that orients us as to where we are in the problem space. And then we can get to thinking about frameworks and processes and then standards. On the citations um, and AI publications we've highlighted in the research development chapter, how much of the citation activity is driven by language? Um, according to this audience member, I heard there's a lot, there's a large body of AI researchers in the Chinese language that's less noticed. 
Yeah, so we, we, we've thought about this question, as has our, our data partner, CSET, who we've yeah. worked with on this. And a, like Archive, for instance, the preprint server, actually seems to be fairly um, sort of equal geographically. I, I think that you just see Chinese researchers routinely submit there in very high volumes. You know, I've been reading Archive every day for several years for my newsletter, and my, my, I've seen like a sustained rise there. I've also seen the US and China show up in sort of equal amounts. It, it kind of makes sense of my model of, of what's happening. I have also been obsessed by the idea that there's a load of dark matter AI research in China, which we aren't measuring. And I think that there's some of this, but a lot of it is actually connected to like journals affiliated with the People's Liberation Army. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, I just mean the way science journal publications work in China is there's a, there's a like much larger number of journals which are sort of links links to the PLA or links to other CCP interests. And those are harder for us to access and are, are in Chinese. But I don't know that those journals correlate to the same sort of research that we're measuring here. I suspect that those journal things and the ones I've managed to get my hands on have been more about deployed systems or architectures for systems you might deploy. Whereas this kind of research we're measuring here is like transformers or like, here's how like a big language model might work. So I'm, I'm I, it's a good question. I don't feel like what we have is like actually that misleading today. I think what we need to caveat it more because as, as my answer gives, like there's a ton of complexity behind why we measure it the way we do. Yeah, uh, I think we have time for just one more questions, but there are a lot more um, and I really appreciate um, all your questions here. So one of the common challenges that, you know, to measurement or um, ethics reviews is that industry are reluctant to very protective their data. How can we shift the culture to make third party validations and data sharing enhance transparency to consumers? Well, there's a chicken and egg problem here. Industry data isn't released because it's valuable. Industry data is valuable because industry has built expensive infrastructure to harvest data. I don't think you can really mandate industry to give up all of its data unless you radically reconfigure competition law in America. And maybe people can do that, but look, based on based on how, how legislation works, it seems unlikely. The reason I back things like the National Research Cloud and other initiatives is we need to create a big computer with a load of engineers, links to civil society and academia, and then we need to ga start gathering data sets and building shared models. That's the way to gain leverage with regard to industry. It also allows you to replicate the sorts of models industry is developing and critique them in public and then say to Google, not, not to pick on Google, just as an example, hey, Google, we know you do this model. We replicated this model here and it has these grotesque problems. What are you, what are you doing about that? And I think that that gives leverage in those conversations that we currently lack today. Uh Thanks, Jack. Uh, it's been a wonderful discussion. Great presentation. Where the oh, just by Jack. the way, because I said, "Hey Google," my phone is now uh, <laughs> transcribing what I said. Very, very, very appropriate ending yeah, to it. Perfect. Like this. <laughs> um, but uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. And uh, our report was published two weeks ago on March 16th. You can read it uh, with the links here. And Jack has left his Twitter channel, and I've left my email here. If you have any questions or engaging um, uh, for collaboration opportunities. We will publish, uh, we will post a um, video of this presentation on the Hi YouTube channel soon, um, so you can view it there. And thanks again for joining us today. We'll see you at the next research seminar with the remaining spring quarters. And in one year when the AI index comes yes. out again. <laughs> All right, see you Thank later. You. Thank you. Bye everyone.